Okay, this is my second time recording this video, so if I sound weird in places, then yeah, that's why. Um, so this PowerPoint's called Light and Manner. It's the third one that we're recording, well, that we're looking at as part of this area of study. Um, it's also, I think, the last one, but there used to be a fourth part to this area of study. It was on Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. I'm pretty sure every part of that has been scrapped from this year's course just due to COVID, uh, but I'm gonna have to double check and then um, maybe put up another video on bits and pieces. I don't think I will, but I'll double check. And so this might be the last one, might not be. Um, it's called Light and Matter. Uh, and that's basically also the name of our area of study. It's very rainy outside, it's very dramatic. Um, but we've looked at that a bit in previous lessons. When we looked at the photoelectric effect, we had some metal with electrons in it, light came in, um, interacted with an electron, which is matter, um, and then we got the photoelectric effect resulting from that. That was light and matter interacting. Um, but today we're going to be looking very directly at how light and matter actually interact with each other. We do that in terms of electron energy levels, which is, I've given this, uh, made that the subtitle of this because it's really the main gist of what we're going to be doing today. So it says that for a long time it was observed that different elements absorb different wavelengths of light but do not absorb all the other wavelengths. So if you've got, say, a container that's transparent and you've got a gas of one particular element inside that container, um, then if you shine the white light through into that container, um, on the other side, when the, where the light comes out, most of the light that went in, um, most of the spectrum, is still going to be there. It's going to go in and it's going to come out unchanged. Um, but certain wavelengths of light, say this one, that one, that one, and that one, um, if your element happens to be hydrogen, they're going to go missing along the way. So the white light goes in, most of it comes out the other side unscathed, um, but you've got these missing bits where there's no light corresponding to those wavelengths or those frequencies. Um, and if we take all those wavelengths together, we get what we call the absorption spectrum of that element. This one, like I said, is going to be for hydrogen. Um, so it's indicating to us that this one and that one, those four wavelengths, they're all getting absorbed by the hydrogen gas in the container. They're the only wavelengths that are actually interacting with the um, hydrogen gas. All the others, they're just not interacting with the hydrogen. They're just going straight through it like it's not there. Um, but these ones are actually going to interact with the hydrogen. They're going to get absorbed um, by the hydrogen. Um, and we're going to look at a bit more what else is involved. Um, but they're being absorbed by the hydrogen, um, and so they're disappearing from the emerging light um, where the other ones are still there. Um, and we can use that to basically identify elements. When I did this first recording, I kind of was a bit ambitious and talked about this more than I probably should have. Um, but the basic idea is if we shoot light into a container, every element has its own characteristic absorption spectrum. So if we shot white light into a container with an unknown gas and we said this one's missing, that one's missing, these ones are all missing, we could consult our chart of elements and their absorption spectrum and we could go, oh, this must be hydrogen gas because um, those particular wavelengths are the ones that go missing. Different elements are going to have different um, gaps in their spectrum. spectra. Um, we can also look at what we call the emission spectrum of an element, um, which is that if we give energy to an element, you can heat it up, you can pass a current through it. Uh, either of those things are going to give it energy. Um, it's going to give off certain wavelengths of light. So uh, if we were, maybe I'll record a little quick video on this afterwards. might be a good idea. Um, but We've got some, what do you call them, lamps over in E3 um, corresponding to different elements. You turn on the lamp, it's got a bit of um, gas in it. Um, I think it's gas that does it in there. I don't think it's metal. Um, but the idea is that the kind of light that you get out depends on the elements that's involved. So um, when you run the currents through the lamp, um, depending on what elements in there, um, that affects what wavelengths of light get emitted and what light you get out. Um, be a good thing to recall it later, but my memory is a bit shoddy right now, so I might forget. Uh, who knows? Uh, and all the wavelengths that are in the absorption spectrum are also in the emission spectrum. So I forget, yeah, this one's actually convenient. You probably won't be able to see it on the TV, but probably on the PowerPoint that's on Compass. Um, you can see it. We've got this one, that one, that one, and that one. And what do you know? They happen to be the same spots that the lines were missing from my hydrogen absorption spectrum. So this was that light goes in and some wavelengths don't come out. This is that we give energy to some um, hydrogen gas, normally it would be, um, and these are the wavelengths of light that are going to be emitted. You get a mixture of them, um, so 
the color that you get wouldn't just be that one, that one, or that one. It would be the light that you get by mixing those colors together, I believe. Um, and down here we've got the emission spectrum of a different element. So you can see it's got lines in completely different places. It's got more lines. Um, that's just telling us that it's not hydrogen, it's some other element. I've taken this from your textbook, so if you're curious about what element is, look it up. I generally can't remember. Um, but the small detail is that sometimes there are extra lines that you get in your emission spectrums that you wouldn't find in your absorption spectrums. That was a bit of a mystery about why this one, well, in this case, the hydrogen ones match up. But for some elements, you get extra lines. And the question was, well, why is that the case? Why does this one not exactly match up with its corresponding absorption spectrum? Why would this line maybe be here, um, but not be in the absorption spectrum of whatever element that is? Um, and we approach that using what we call Bohr's model of the atom. Hopefully, you can hear me over the rain. If it's a problem, then you know that's a problem. But Bohr's model of the atom, we're talking about electrons. They're orbiting the nucleus. And they can only do that at certain discrete energy levels, which means that they can only have certain energy levels in order for their orbits to be stable. If they don't have those particular energy levels, they're going to lose energy until they do fall down to a stable orbit. We're going to look at what constitutes a stable orbit towards the end of this lesson, but to start out with, you just got to kind of accept it as a bit of a fact. They're going to have their discrete energy levels. And discrete means like... In maths, discrete is like you've got a whole thing, you don't have any halves, so you've got like, you know, people, you've got one person, you've got two people, you don't really have one and a half people. Um, so that would be a discrete thing. The energy levels, um, they have to be one or they have to be another, they can't be in between. Uh, that's illustrated pretty well using, holy Christ, that did not come up well in the black background. Uh, but you can still see, yeah, I would not try and read that based off the video, but Look at the PowerPoint on Compass, you can see this. Maybe I'll put it up with a white background so it's a bit clearer. Um, we've got our electron energy level diagram. So the gist of one of these is that an electron can have this energy level, or it can have that energy level, or it can have this one or that one. It can have any of the lines, but it can't have in-betweens. An electron can't have an energy level down here. Um, that's just not what Bohr's model, uh, that's what Bohr's model tells us. They can't have in-between levels, just certain discrete ones. Um, and I did a bit of Googling. I think this is the energy level of lithium, an ion of lithium. Um, ideally, I would have put up the hydrogen. Like the hydrogen ones are classic because your numbers, well, you see them all the time for when you're dealing with energy level diagrams. But uh, basically, this just it works for what it needs to be. Um, other elements are going to have energy level diagrams with the same structure. These lines are going to be there regardless of what element we've got. Um, but different energies on the left, so you probably can't see this, but here we've got negative 122.4 electron volts. We're using electron volts because it makes the numbers a bit more manageable. We don't have times 10 to the negative 19s and whatnot. We've just got normal 122.4s, um, minus 30.6, minus 13.6 electron volts. Just, um, electrons have to have those energies in orbit, and you can see the lines bunch up closer and closer as you get to the top. Um, we're not going to look at that in too much detail. Um, so I keep repeating that picture because I reckon that you know, illustrates a fair bit. Uh, electrons can only have certain discrete energy levels when they're orbiting a lithium nucleus. The lowest energy state, and this is the lowest one even though it's got the biggest number next to it, uh, we call that the ground state. And we also represent these states using certain numbers um, with the letter n. So here we've got n equals 1, that's our lowest state. We've got our n equals 2 state, or n equals 3, 4, 5. In theory, we've got an infinite number of lines between here and here. They get closer and closer together. Um, but, you know, we draw maybe 8 or so, something like that. Um, and then we stop. Um, we call this the ground state. It is the state that electrons are going to naturally sit in. Um, I think I mentioned that later on, but I don't know why I don't mention it now. Um, yeah, electrons naturally sit in the ground state. It's the next thing I should have read. So if you've got an electron and it hasn't been given any energy externally um, from heat or from electricity or something, the electron's going to be sitting in this ground state. Um, then it can get some energy and it's going to jump up to one of the excited states. That's why we call these by that name. First excited state, second excited state. It's excited, it's been given energy. Um, so we just call those the excited states and they're just different to the natural ground state that an electron's going to be in if it hasn't been given any energy. 
Um, and then last point on there, if an electron receives what we call the ionization energy, it's going to have enough energy to jump out of the atom. And if it does, well, you've got an atom, it loses an electron because the electron jumps away, it's been ionized. It's turned into an ion with more positive charge than negative charge, so it's going to be an ion as a result. Um, so that's why we call it ionization. And you can figure out that the ionization is going to occur up here. Um, an electron is in the ground state. It's going to need at least 122.4 electron volts of energy to jump up out of this atom. Um, so that's just what this number down the bottom tells us, how much energy an electron in an atom is going to need to leave, how much energy is going to have to be given th to that atom in order to ionize it. Put this up so you can have a read while I drink. Hmm. Okay. If this thing realigns itself, come on. Um, so these energies are written as negatives, so negative 122.4, um, and normally negative energies, and they're more of a conceptual thing, you can't have a negative energy, but um, we talk about these negative energies because um, if an electron is in the ground state, it's going to, uh, and it receives 122.4 electron volts of energy, it jumps out of the atom, leaves the atom, um, but it's got zero electron volts of kinetic energy after that. So all the energy that it gets, the 122.4 electron volts, go towards getting it out of the atom. It's got no leftover energy, so it ends up with zero electron volts of energy. So it's a bit of math. You end up with zero electron volts. You are given 122.4 electron volts. It just makes sense that you must have started out with negative 122.4 electron volts because this plus 122.4 adds up to zero electron volts of kinetic energy, you must have started with a negative value. So we're just talking about it's bound to an atom. This is its potential energy. Um, it's a negative just because it tells us that the electron is bound to the atom and needs that much energy in order to leave the atom. So that's just what these negatives on the side mean. Um, normally it's just the numbers that we worry about when we're doing calculations, not the negatives. Um, as a side note, we can also represent electron energy levels using circles, like the ground state, the first excited state, second excited state. Um, you do more of this stuff in chemistry, really, than in physics, but you just need to know that if you see a picture like this, it's an energy level diagram, but it's just drawn in a slightly different way. All the other details on there, not important to physics, well, not important to this physics course. Uh, so when an electron in the ground state interacts with a photon, it absorbs the energy of the photon, if the energy of the photon would get it to a higher energy level. So we can use the energy level diagram to figure out which wavelengths of light will be absorbed by the element. Uh, and I'll just read to my example, that's probably best. So we've got an electron in the ground state. To get to the first excited state, to get from down here to up here, the electron has to absorb a photon with an energy exactly equal to the difference between these two levels. So we do a bit of maths. We say, well, this is 122.4, that's 30.6. The difference between them is going to be 91.8 electron volts. Um, I ignore the negatives just because, well, otherwise I get an answer of minus negative, uh, negative 91.8 electron volts, and that wouldn't be handy for me. Um, so that's the difference between those, those two levels. Um, if a photon has an energy of 91.8 electron volts, I can do a bit of maths using my previous lesson stuff. I know that the energy of a photon is Planck's constant times the frequency, and I also know that I can take that equation and turn it into a different form, so that we've got energy equals Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by the wavelength. I do some rearrangement of that equation, get the wavelength on its own in terms of Planck's constant, which is a constant, in terms of the speed of light, which is a constant, and in terms of the energy. Um, and this is one of those ways you can employ some shortcuts, but if you're not confident in doing this, then you'd want to do it the long way. You'd want to take this energy and convert it into joules, your standard units, and then use the Planck's constant version that is in joule seconds, which is your standard units. But I'm employing a shortcut because I've got um, electron volt seconds up the top. I can have electron volts down the second, uh, down the bottom. I don't need to convert this energy into joules. I can just use its electron volts value if I use the electron volt seconds version of Planck's constant. So here I've got Planck's constant in electron volt seconds, speed of light, it's not going to change. Um, and then we've got the energy 
equal to the difference between the two levels down the bottom. Put in my calculator those numbers and I get out 1.35 times 10 to the negative 8 meters. So that's just how you do, do a calculation like that. You can figure out that if an electron's in the ground state, it needs to absorb a photon with exactly this much energy in order to jump up to the first excited state. If the electron had a smaller wavelength, the ele uh, so if the photon had a smaller wavelength, it just wouldn't get absorbed um, because it's not going to be able to kick that electron up to the first state. If it had a sorry, if it had a smaller wavelength, it would have a higher frequency, so it would have more energy, so it would go above um, and it wouldn't get it to exactly a certain level, um, so that photon wouldn't get absorbed. Um, if it had a larger wavelength, it would have a smaller frequency, so it's less energy so it wouldn't be able to get the electron up to this level. So just the point of all this is that it can only absorb discrete certain energy photons um, if the wavelength or the frequency or the energy aren't exactly the right amount. They're just not going to get absorbed and the light would just go straight through um, the gas um, without getting absorbed. It's only going to be those very specific wavelengths of light that are going to get absorbed when um, yeah, get absorbed and kick the electron from the ground state up to the first state. Um, and you can use a bit of logic here that, well, one wavelength gets absorbed and kicks the electron up from the ground state to the first excited state. A second ele uh, photon gets absorbed and kicks it up from the ground state to the second excited state. So the photons that are going to get absorbed by the element are from here to here, or from here to here, or from here to here. Um, if we have an anti-level diagram, we can just basically figure out all the possible wavelengths that are going to get absorbed by a particular element by just going, well, we can figure out the anti-level differences and we know that when the electron absorbs the photon, it's always going to be in the ground state. So we don't have to worry about for absorption the difference between here and here. It's always just the difference for absorption from ground to one of the excited states. Find the energy difference. You can use that to calculate the wavelength and that's got to be a wavelength that can get absorbed by that particular element. Uh, have a read. Uh, okay. Get this to refocus. Um, I'm not talking 17 minutes, golly gosh. Uh, so, say an electron absorbs a photon with an energy of 108.8 electron volts starts in the ground state, absorbs that photon, and it gets kicked up to the n equals 3 level. So up to this level, second excited state. I keep saying kicked up, I like saying kicked up, but that's not official terminology, so probably don't go repeating what I say in that sense because, I don't know, it just feels natural in the moment, but whatever. Um, so the electron gets sent up to the second excited state, it absorbs a photon and gets its energy and goes up to the higher energy level. Um, but electrons, they want to be in the ground state. So what's going to happen is that that electron in the second excited state, it's going to now emit photons, or one photon, we'll talk about it in a bit. Um, it's going to give off photons, give off that energy, and drop back down to the ground state. Um, so it's going to want to get rid of the energy that's received by emitting photons. It absorbed photons, now it's going to emit them. Um, and it's going to want to go from up here back to down here. Um, however, that energy doesn't have to be emitted all at once. It's possible for the electron to fall back to the ground state in stages. So I've got a nice picture. I reckon it's pretty good. Um, we've got that the electron is up in the n equals 3 state. The question says the electron's in the n equals 3 state. What are the possible photon energies that could be emitted as the electron fell back to the ground state? So we're up here and we want to get back down to here. Now the most direct way is it starts here and it falls straight back down to there. Um, and the energy difference between those two levels is going to be 122.4, take away 13.6. That's going to be the 108.8 electron volts that it absorbed to get up there in the first place. Uh, so that's one of the possible energies that could be emitted by that electron as it falls back down. And we could do a calculation then and find what wavelength that would correspond to like I did before, but I just haven't done that as part of this just to speed things up. Um, it could go that way. Or it could go in two steps. It could go from the first, uh, the n equals 3 state to the n equals 2 state and from there drop back down from n equals 2 to n equals 1. Um, so two possible ways it could go either here or here. Um, 
all those way, uh, possible ways that the electron could fall down to the lower energy state and so these are just going to be all the possible electron energies that could be released as the electron falls back down. So we can figure out this energy as it falls from n equals 3 to n equals 2. Um, that's going to be 30.6, take away 13.6, 17 electron volts. Um, and the second possible one is going to be from 30.6 down to 122.4. The difference between these two is going to be 91.8. So we've got three possible energies for the photons that can be emitted when the electron falls from second excited state back down to ground state. It's going to be the 108.8, um, the 17 electron volts, and the 19, sorry, 91.8 electron volts as well. Um, those three are the three possible ones. Each one would correspond to a certain wavelength of light, um, and we could calculate those again if you were, you know, in the mood for it. Um, so the Bohr model of the atom. Uh, I've talked about how we use it to describe electron energy levels. Uh, it works really well for hydrogen atoms and what we call hydrogen-like atoms. Something's hydrogen-like if it's got one electron orbiting it. So the lithium ion that I was using for my energy level diagrams, I think it's the sort of lithium ion that only has one electron. Um, if it's got more electrons, then those electrons interact in ways. You've got like the Pauli exclusion principle, which is something that you used to learn about in chemistry. I don't think you learn about it anymore, which is a shame. Um, but the electrons interact when you've got more than one in an atom, and that basically affects the model that you use. You get things like electron energy level splitting, and it gets very messy very quickly. Um, so it doesn't work for multiple electrons, um, and exactly what that would look like with multiple electrons definitely beyond the scope of this course, um, but it works well when you've got one electron in your atom. So it's not that the model is crap, it's not that it's not true, it's just that it only works within a limited context when we're talking about certain kinds of atoms. I need a drink, my throat's very sore, maybe I'm getting the COVID, but... Hmm. So, when we're thinking about discrete energy levels... Hello. Um, I said before that electrons can only have discrete energy levels, and I said just take my word on that, we'll talk about it later, and now's when I'm coming back to that. Uh, I like keeping the track on these to make sure I'm not going too long, but um, we're going to actually pull an idea from our previous area of study for this, and that is the idea of the standing wave, the idea that we've got a wave um, and we get our nodes and our anti-nodes as a result of the wave interacting with its reflected version and whatnot, but we don't go into too much detail about that here. What matters is that, I keep this running, uh, that for a stable orbit to exist, we need a standing wave to form, and for that to happen, a whole multiple of the electron's wavelength would have to fit into the orbital radius. Uh, and there's two ways of illustrating that, the way that's hard to draw, which is this one, and the way that's easy to draw, which is on the next slide, which I really like drawing. Um, so we've got like a certain radius that the electron's orbiting around. You might have the nucleus of the atom in the middle, um, and the electron's just orbiting around it. And we know that the electron, it's going to have its de Broglie wavelength. It's going to be treated as a wave for the purpose of this. It's got its wavelength, um, and it's going to be that. That's its wavelength. So in order for the electron to have a stable orbit, a whole number of wavelengths would need to fit around the circumference of its orbit. So this is the circumference of its orbit. A whole number of wavelengths fits in, and we know that they fit in because if we start here and go all the way around, um, when we get back to here, it basically fits and matches up. If you look at the one over here, we start, we go around. When it gets back, it's not matching up. A whole number of wavelengths isn't fitting into the circumference of the orbit. Um, you wouldn't get a stable orbit, so the electron would fall to a lower energy level where it would have a stable orbit. Um, so, again, it's just the nature of this type of physics where... You learn more things and you learn answers to questions and it just raises more questions. But yeah, this is the extent to which you really need to know about it. You need your electron's wavelength. Um, a whole multiple of that needs to fit within the circumference of its orbital radius um, for there to be a stable orbit. Uh, and the very last slide. Uh, and this is basically, there's going to be more content relating to the practical investigation. The practical investigation isn't just that you do an experiment and you write about it, and etc. Um, there is content related to it and things that you'll need to learn that are examinable. Um, so I'll be doing a few lessons on that. 
um, and then also going back and doing that analysis of the um, cart down the ramp experiment that we did actually yesterday, yes, yeah, Tuesday. Um, but the last thing for this is, and the last bit of content relating to this area of study, um, is that I said before that the whole number of wavelengths, so lambda times 1 or lambda times 2 or lambda times 3, um, so n times lambda, has to fit into the circumference of the electron's orbit. So the circumference of a circle, 2 pi r, um, that's going to be our circumference of the orbit. Um, lambda is the wavelength of uh, the electron's de Broglie wavelength. N can be, I don't think n can be 0. I wrote n equals 0, but that's probably wrong, so scrap that. Um, but an equivalent way of writing this is that the circumference has to be equal to some number, whole number, integer, um, times the wavelength. Now, I super like these pictures. Um, I prefer drawing them because I just like drawing them, they're fun. Um, but you've got your orbital radius and you've got your wavelengths. And if you see, you can't see this on the TV, uh, on the screen I'd imagine, but on the PowerPoint that I've uploaded, or should you remind me if I haven't, um, you can see that we've got one, two, three, I didn't count that right, one, two, three wavelengths of um, the electron fitting into the orbit. So this would be a stable orbit. Here we've got one, two, three, four, so it's down the bottom if you want a quick way of finding it out. Um, wavelengths fitting within the orbit. Here we've got five, here we've got six. So those pictures are just basically showing how electrons got a wavelength and a whole number of those wavelengths, six times, uh, six lots of the wavelength are fitting with the orb, uh, within the orbital radius here, within the circumference of the radius. Um, so, let me get that. Um, these would all be stable orbits. That's just basically what these pictures are doing. They're showing this information that was here. How many wavelengths do we have here? One, two, three, four, five. We've got six wavelengths. So it's an equivalent way of showing what's in this picture here. Six wavelengths fitting within the circumference of the orbit. Um, and I mentioned before that with this we're talking about standing waves. So we've got antinodes, we've got nodes. It looks like it's up here and down there, but these are going to be going back and forth in the way that we know standing waves do. These are going up and down, and nodes are going to stay in place. So um, these waves are just going to be going up and down, and these nodes are going to be staying where they are, um, just like we found when we looked at standing waves you know, earlier um, this term. So it's a bit of a... Uh, I like this sort of stuff. I guess our area... What do you call it? Unit 3... Unit 3 is just stuff about you know motion, power generation, all that stuff. It's very much engineering based, it's physics, but um, basically towards an engineering end. This stuff, it's more actual physics in terms of you know what physicists look at. It's less engineering, and I like it for that, but I guess some people, they're looking down that engineering path and thinking that this stuff's a bit too, I think airy fairy is the word people use, but I don't know, I like it. It's got a certain beauty to it. Um, but if that's not you, then that's all right too. You still got to learn it though. So uh, this is, I believe, 10.3. Again, I haven't checked my question plan since I recorded the last video, but the idea is that you should be getting this stuff done. Um, and then we'll be doing... Ah, oh, we still have the sack to do for the first area of stuff at, the, at, uh, at this point in time. So this is way too far down the track for me, but... We'll spend a lesson on revision. We'll spend a lesson doing the SAC, which I still need to get organized with the teacher over at Niram. Um, and I'll let you know about that in the comments on Teams. So um, that stuff's going to be forthcoming, but I'm recording these videos early, so I don't have to do them frantically later on. Um, so that's just why I've got limited information now, but you will get that information hopefully soon. Hopefully I'm posting it even as I post this video. Um, and that's it for from me.